thank you for coming to the session. And let's start with this. So the session's goal is improving your Drupal 8 development workflow. I was talking about a few concepts about how to start a new project with Composer, how to manage dependencies using Composer, and from there how you can move, I mean, move ahead for getting your project deployed to a production server. I mean, I won't be touching any like product or platform. I will talk more about concepts and showing you some snippets of code that you can use and take advantage for doing something like this in your own workflow, implement in your own workflow. <coughs> well, before I start starting this, uh, my name is Jesus Manuel Olivas, which I totally missed putting my name here. So Jesus Manuel Olivas, I'm just partnering, I'm just partnering with other two good friends uh, with this new company, it's called Wino. So you can find us if you need like consulting or training or development. We have developers in like nine countries. So let us know. And you can find me on either, well, really most of the social networks using JMOLIVAS, same as Drupal.org, or tweeting with the Wino account as well. So the topics that we were touching during the session is First, we'll talk about a code base. I mean, what a code means, what a code base means, and how can we have something like this and implement it in our project. The second, we'll talking about, I mean, dependencies and how to manage all dependencies, either project code like package dependencies, or even in, and also infrastructure dependencies for your project. We're also talking about config, which is like this is not like configuration management of Drupal mostly how to like manage the configuration of your server, like you know, like how you handle or uh, your variables per environment, <clears throat> if you are building like your site and you're building like a development site and then a testing environment and a staging or a place where you are building your, your site and then pushing this to your production server. And finally, we're talking about the deployment, some deployment and the scripts about some deployment scripts, it's something like we call something like build, release, and, and run. This is part, this could be in part of your like CI or continuous integration or actually on your continuous delivery. It means like you can keep pushing changes often. So first thing, first, let's go with code base. You should have, the rule said you should have only one code base per application, in this case per website. You should have only one repository for managing all of your code. And obviously, this project may have some dependencies, but then for that, we will be using a dependency manager for, for handling all those, all those dependencies, right? So ideally, only code that, that you are writing for this application should be, should be stored on, the, on, your, on your repo. And uh, you should use a version control system like Git. You can use other, but probably the most famous one at this point is Git. And ideally, you should have the same one, the same code base to do many deploys. It means if you are deploying to a staging or you're deploying a pull request or you're deploying to production, you should use the same code, code base. So we have something like this, right? One code base and multiple deploys, right? So we only have one repo and you can deploy to multiple servers or multiple stages. Then we have something like this. Ideally, when while working with Drupal, there's some people, you know, there's some like best practices, been there for a while. People said, I mean, it's up to you, you follow this or not. People used to sell, like, I mean, it's a good idea to have an, make your site an installation profile. And the good thing about having an installation profile is that you can provide your site with some specific, specific functionality out of the box, so you don't have to build your site from scratch every single time. So ideally, you should have some of your, of those um, like pieces of code handled by, by something you can, some, some module called features, right? So you package certain group of, I mean, of configuration into something called features, you put it in your site, like you make it part of your installation profile. So next time you install your site, you have all those, I mean, those little pieces I mean, to start working with. So you don't start from scratch every single time. I mean, there's some people who's to say, oh, you know, now that we have the configuration management, we'll, we'll, I mean, there is a need for features. I mean, it seems like features now, I mean, uh, will be used for what was, I mean, what was, I mean, created for, right? We originally, feature was created for manage and, or package um, configuration, but people on Drupal 7 
abuse features a little and use it for, I mean, managing the whole configuration of the site. I mean, but at that point, where's probably there was like either, I mean, abusing features or you're moving your database all over I mean, different stages with at some point, let's, you know, let's use feature instead. But in this case, right? You can use, you can keep using features for, for what feature was created for. Then ideally, you should keep rebuilding or reinstalling your site um, from, the conf from, from those configuration files. It means you are building, making changes, right? The ideally, you should I mean, like create a new site, you know, site install something, just create a new database and import all of those configurations just to confirm and make sure all of your changes are on the, on the repo, are, it means are on the file system, it means all those, all that configuration is in, the, is, in, is in code, it's not only on the database. It means you already export it as code. Again, in order to having something like this to keep, be able to keep rebuilding your site, there is some, there's, you have options. There is the uh, config installer profile, and you can also <coughs> have, you can also have, I mean, features for doing this. It just, I mean, it's up to you. And uh, if you want to know how to, how to work in with profiles, there is a, uh, this issue, which is really cool. So now in Drupal, well, it's, it's still a patch, but you can start using, playing with it. It's stuck to 8.4. You can start working from, from now, you can start extending profile. Let's say you can use a base profile and extend, and extend that one in, in, with your own profile, I mean, installation, which is really cool because you don't have to keep doing things all over again. So I mean, you can, have, you can take advantage of a base profile like Lightning or Thunder or any of those, or those profiles and just extend and use add specific pieces of configuration that you want to have in your site. It means you don't have to like override things. It's basically more, you, ex you extend it and then you make changes in your own profile. If you are interested about rebuilding your site every single time, the problem, not the problem, but an issue with configuration is like every time you install your site, it gives you like new UUID number. And then if you try to import a, the, um, I mean, the configuration that you export before and you just run something like, let's say you have a site, you export configuration, then you run site install, I mean, you destroy the database and create a new one. You try to import that configuration that you previously export, ain't gonna work. But if you want to do that, that's, this is the, this is the place. So you need to take a look, keep, I mean, follow this project. So it's called config installer and you will need to apply this patch as well. So there's, there's an issue, there's a patch for it so you can, Following instructions here, you can start rebuilding your sites from configuration. Or again, if you don't want to do this, you can keep exporting your, configura your configuration as features and then I mean, make them make the feature import part of your building process. And we'll see how this looks like in, in a I mean, <coughs> ahead. Okay, now, now let's talk about dependencies. Remember what I mentioned? We have two types of dependencies. Each, uh, every dependency that your project has should be declared in code, either application dependencies and the infrastructure dependencies. When I'm talking about infrastructure, I mean, I mean what the uh, OS that your project requires, I mean, which, I mean, like extensions, PHP extensions your project requires as well. So talking about application dependencies, in this case, since we are using Drupal, Drupal it's using PHP, we will be using Composer. While using a, um, a dependency manager for a specific language, you should declare your dependencies in something that is called a manifest file. In the case of Composer, it is a composer.json file. Okay, so if we are using Composer, we'll have this composer.json file who contains any of the dependencies that our project requires. While using, when using Composer, you can even declare, you know, I want PHP 7 or or I mean, or, or five point something. I want to have this extension enabled in the system, but that doesn't, I mean, force you to have the dependency. That only like break your, I mean, composer install execution if you don't have that in the system. So that's why you should also have your infrastructure on code or as code. And please make sure you use the the proper the appropriate dependency manager for the language. I mean, if you are using. If you are requiring a PHP package, use Composer. If you are requiring something like JavaScript from the JavaScript world, you can probably use something like NPM or Bower or, or Jarn or something like that, right? There is a way, there are ways you can use Composer to require JavaScript libraries, but you should, I mean, actually, 
even there are some issues on the composer side, and even the, the, the maintainer of composer tells you, like, you should not be doing this. There are tools for that. If you are, again, if you are requiring PHP packages, use I mean, the dependency manager for that package, which is in this case is composer. Well, we, I mean, we just have a good old friend, right, Rushmic, and this is the one we were using for years. Now, I mean, Composer is here. Composer is well maintained. It's mature enough. It's maintained. I mean, it's, it was, I mean, it's in a stand there. So a lot of, most of the uh, modern PHP frameworks are using it. So, so that's why Drupal, it's, it's also uh, taking advantage of this one. So how Composer works? Again, so what is Composer? But as I mentioned, is a package manager for PHP. Composer should be used for managed dependencies per project, right? Even when there is this Composer global require who allows you to get dependencies globally in the system, it's not a good idea. Ideally, you should isolate all those dependencies per project, right? Um, the problem with requiring global dependencies is sometimes you have conflicts between them. It's, let's talk about a project that I mean, I, I, do, I do maintain it's Drupal console, and at some point when we started working with this, we decided to go like global installation because make it easier. Just one install per per computer, and then you I mean you don't have to like keep maintaining different versions. But the problem with this, when you are having like a global definition, you start with I mean, several issues. First is like since we are using some other projects like like Drupal Commerce. And those, I mean, Drupal Commerce provide you with a CLI, and that also I mean, recommend you to like install globally. What it happens, what, we, what, we, what I see happening is, we were re Drupal console were requiring a specific version of Symfony component, like Symfony console or Twig, right? Like, let's say 2.1 point something, and then, I mean, the CLI from Commerce guys were requiring a different version, and then we start seeing a lot of issues with them, like you know, fighting. I mean, every. I mean, every Composer update of Drupal Console or from the or from Drupal Commerce, I mean, ZLI, we're fighting for resolving all those issues and dependencies. And at some point, you know, it's like, I can no longer keep updating Drupal Console. Or I can no longer keep updating, um, the, I mean, Drupal Commerce CLI. So we decide, well, in this case, uh, when, I, when I'm talking to Drupal Commerce, I mean, like, like platform, yeah, right? And we decide to go the other route. So, and go to the original route, because when we start Drupal Console, we were doing Composer required Drupal console per Drupal site, and people were complaining about, like, yo, you're hacking core because you're changing the Composer file. And I was like, no, this is the way how it works. I mean, this is how, the way how we just, we should manage dependencies. But at that point, Drupal was not like, ignoring like third party libraries. It means the vendor directory where those libraries are, it was part of the repo. So, I mean, must, it means it was not ignored. From the repository, so that's why people, I mean, also kind of complain about what's hacking core. They were changing a file that people think was part of core, but it's not. Drupal core has its own composer file. It's within the core directory, right? It's not on the root of the project. And there, you know, it also Drupal take advantage of an external library for merging those, I mean, those both composer files, and you know, get dependencies for you. But again, first thing, remember, please. Keep dependencies per project. So how Composer works? There is a workflow for Composer. It's really, really simple, and it's I mean it's not that hard to understand. So again, you define your dependencies into a manifest file, right? This is, is where this is the Composer JSON file. It's here. This file contains any dependency of your project. Let's say if your project is depending in admin toolbar, you have a section where you define this this dependency in this Composer JSON file. But then, then you run Composer install the first time. Let's think about this is the first time I'm just running this project. I don't have a Composer log. What it happens with Composer, when the whole process finished, it creates a Composer log for you, Composer log file for you. I'll talk about in a few. The first time you run it, you don't have this Composer log file. So what it happens, Composer, you execute Composer from the CLI, something like Composer install or update. In this case, it doesn't matter because you don't have the log file. It read all of the dependencies in this file. Then uh, go to a place called packages. Let's say packages.org is the place where all of the packages, all the PHP packages are registered. Well, not all. Drupal packages are registered within Drupal.org. But well, most of the libraries, PHP libraries, take use packages, right? So basically, Composer go to a place where all those definitions are set. So 
So, I mean, if you're acquiring Admin Toolbar or the Bell or, you know, Drupal Console or any other dependency in your project, there is a place where this, is a, where this definition is, is created. In this case, we call this like Packages Archiver. From here, what Composer gets from here is the place where the source code from this repo is living. Right? It means if I am requiring admin toolbar, it means this code is living somewhere else. Like, could be like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab or anything. In the case of Drupal, it's living in Drupal.org. So it matches, you know, this package is living here, so I just get it from the system. Once finished getting from the system, it ends up like adding a vendor directory, creating a vendor directory in your local system, and finally, finally, creates, creates this composer log file. This composer log file contains the exact version you downloaded or composer downloaded here, right? So what composers do in the process of going from here to here to the final step of creating the composer like composer log file, get the dependencies, do his best for best for matching. I mean, the, if, if there's any conflicts, so fixing conflicts between them. Because sometimes one library has conflicts with conflict with other libraries, so compo composer takes care of. I mean, fixing all that for you. And if your package or if your dependency has all the dependencies, it, Composer also takes care of that, you know. Take care of getting your dependencies and the dependencies of your dependencies and, you know, like so on, the dependencies of the dependencies of your dependencies. And again, in the end, it creates this Composer log file for you with the exact version that was downloaded in, in, your, in your application. And good thing about this is next time someone in your team uh, needs to download the uh, dependencies of your project, it only need to run on he only or he or she only need to run composer install. He will read this composer log file and avoid doing all the process of resolving conflicts and trying to find out which if your dependencies are you know where all dependencies are you know it will it will solve all that for you and just download exactly what was defined in this log file which is really cool it also i mean takes advantage of some of caching mechanism so you have a, you have all those dependencies cached in your local system so it won't be like going to you know again to somewhere else like git i mean git github or drupal.org because i mean it's already er, catch in your in your local system. And something you should need to remember is to always commit your composer log file, okay? Because this one, what it contains, you know, the exact version that you, you have defined in your project. So it means any dependency that is required is here, but it's also telling you, it's just using this specific version, it means the rest of your team can just get an exact copy of the site of the dependencies just by running the com a composer install command, right? And you should always run composer install. You, you should never run basically composer update without passing a package you want to update. Because if you run composer out the update without defining a package name, let's say what it will happen is composer will try to upload every single depend I mean update every single dependency in your project. And that could cause some problem because you might be getting the latest version of something that you haven't tested. So ideally, if you want to update a package, you should run Composer Update and just provide the package name that you want to update. Okay. In order to work with Drupal and Composer, there is a really awesome project called Drupal Composer. I highly recommend you to start using this. This is a Composer template. This template contains Drupal, and Drush, Drupal Console, and some and other packages for for you, so you can get Drupal in your in your local, I mean, local computer. It's I mean, it's a great project. I really like how this works. This project could be used like this, right? Composer provides several commands, the same way it provides this Composer install for getting dependencies or Composer update for updating them. It also provides this create project command. This command, while running Composer create project command, what it happens is it clones the project that we are, you are requiring and it also runs the, the compose, Composer install as well. So it clones the project for you and it runs Composer install. It means it gets every single dependency in this project. So by running this command, you will have a full Drupal site, I mean, downloaded in your system. This is like Drush DL that we used to do, right? Or Compose, what was the Drupal console command for site new, I think so. We just, I mean, for the, 
in the road for the stable release, I mean, we're getting rid of all those commands from Drupal console. There's no more site new, there's no more module download. Or we are trying to people to keep using, to using only a composer. We are gonna try to push people to use the right tool for the, for the work. Well, as you can see, well, when running create project, you can pass some options like the module name where, all, where your project will be downloaded. In this case, it's Drupal.org. And then I'm using some flags here like prefer this for instead of getting the cloning every single dependency, just getting the release from the zip, from the tar file, which is better. And there's, I mean, there's, it's, because it's a little faster and also uses catch because it doesn't have to go to, go to the, the repo and git clone it for you, so it's faster because Composer is not the fastest tool in the world. We all know that, right? There's, there are some, there are two, I mean, again, as a really nice, I mean, tip about when running Composer, please disable xdebug from the CLI. That will make it a little more faster or less slower. And it also, there is a project called, oh, wow, what's the name of this? For running like parallel downloads. Oh, I'll get the link in a few, but I don't remember what, what the name of the project. Prestimo. Yeah, that one, Prestimo. Yeah, that's, that's a really cool project. Allow you to look, run like multiple downloads to so make a little faster. I mean, it's better experience. I was reading some issues in the, on Composer project. They were trying to implement something like that, like out of the box, without this Composer plugin, which will be pretty, pretty cool to have. Okay, so again, in order to get a new Drupal site in your system, you can run create project, and this takes care of what? Git cloning and Composer install at the same time. So it means you get the project and all the dependencies, so you are ready to work. This um, Drupal Composer project it provides you a, a git ignore file with base, some basic configuration. So actually, as you can see here, it's, indoor, it's ignoring the vendor directory, it's ignoring web core and all the, all the country modules. It means you, we are ignoring every single package that is dependency by ignoring vendor, core, and modules, themes, and profiles, contrib. And it, it's also ignoring, I mean, the, all, any files, any files for, I mean, from the project. So you don't, I mean, you are not committing all those files files on, the, on your repo. What you, will, what you will find out by using, by using Drupal Composer project, it's a slightly modified version of the directory, so you will find out there is a web direct directory here, and this directory contains all of the Drupal files, right? So any Drupal file is here, and the rest of the files are here. It means vendors, as you can see, vendor directory, it's out of the web public directory, which is great, because that can save you a lot of headaches because any dependency, which is not Drupal dependency, right? Any third party dependency will be download, downloaded here within the vendor directory. And this is outside of web. So you should point your, your I mean, your, this is your public web directory. You, you should point your virtual host, to, I, mean, I mean, to web instead of the root of your project, which is, I mean, again, it's pretty cool because it means no vendor downloaded, I mean, PHP file could be executed from, from here. So it's, it's pretty cool. Another, another nice feature about this one is you can just get any of the, your configurations files outside of the web public directory. Uh, by default, I mean, Drupal creates this, you know, the sites, uh, default files config and provide this, create this huge hatch so people cannot guess where your configuration files live at. Well, by using a directory structure like this, having this web out, I mean, this extra level here, you can, well, you can do something like this. Go to your settings files, make this little change, and just get any configuration that you exported outside of the web public directory. Well, how do you commit your changes, right? Let's say we're using a repo, this is git, you make changes. Again, this is something we're all doing, right? Git add, git commit, push. Let's say I just get my site and I mean, download anything, I mean, just run this one, you know, create project, blah, 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 and just add projects. And then how the rest of the team can obtain a copy, just, again, just git clone and composer install, okay? They don't have, the rest of the team doesn't have to worry about creating the project again, they just need to run composer install, and they will get every single dependency, because, because we committed the composer log file, right? Again, because the composer file contained all, the exact version of the dependencies we downloaded. How do you download modules? Again, there's no more drush DL, please. There's no more module download from Drupal console. If you want to get a new module from Drupal, please use composer require. So composer require and then the package name. In this case, the module we want to get. 
When we are getting, I mean, Drupal modular, modules, themes, or profiles, you will find out that it's always called Drupal slash something. Once you download the module, you, you, might, you, might need, I mean, you want to install in your system, so you will be running something like Drupal module install, and then give it the module name, as you can see. Here, we're only using the module name. Composer is the one who uses Drupal slash as part of the name, right? And then finally, you can go Drupal config export to export you know, the module what's installed. And the rest of, the, of your team can just go fetch, I mean, get, get fetch merge changes or pool, and then run Composer install again. So what it happens when you run Composer require and give it a, I mean, a new package, in this case a module, it modifies your composer log file and your composer JSON file, right? So it, let's say, it says composer required changes both files, change your manifest, or telling you, you know, it, now I'm using also this extra module, which is admin toolbar, but it also changed the composer log file. So then the rest of your team can just run composer install, and this will get this new module that was downloaded before. So again, we are only using composer to managing all dependencies. And finally, again, just run composer, Drupal config import in order to get all of the configuration that was exported on the previous task. And finally, you know, clear cache review. This is, a, remember the CC all command? Now it's called CR or cache review. We need to, in order to get your site. I mean, you will be, you will, you will see in there we'll be running CR more often in Drupal 8 than 7. How to update the module? If I, uh, I know there's a new version of a security issue with the module, I will be running composer update and provide the module name, right? And finally, so, I mean, sometimes when you update a module, there is a pending database update or hooked update. So you can run update execute command and just provide the module name in order to apply those changes in your, in your database. And finally, again, you know, git add, commit, push, create a pull request, someone else, I mean, do a code review and just merge that one. And how the rest of the thing get, the, get all those changes? Same thing. They all need to run Composer install. You know, this is getting more because it's easy. You know, someone else do the change for you. How do you think? Use by Composer install. And in this case, since, I mean, you are, maybe there are some like module updates, you will end up running update execute. You can even, you can pass the name here, I mean the module name, or you can just say all for, I mean, executing any, any hook, I mean, database hook updates. And if you want to update core, you can just use Composer as well, you know, Drupal, I mean, Composer update, Drupal core, with dependencies, and you're all set, right? And you, you probably have to wait a few minutes, probably grab a coffee or a beer or something, but yeah, that will do the work for you. And you know, the good thing about this is like, there's less like human you know, involved, I mean, work involved here, because you know, humans tend to sometimes do mistakes. You know, let's computer do the computer work. And I mean, it's a good practice to manage your infra infrastructure as code as well. The same way we manage our code using a repo, it's a good practice to you manage the, your, your infrastructure as a code. So a good thing is, is in the, ideally, we should have all of the configurations, I mean, in, I mean on the repo as well. And if you aren't using, if you're not using Docker, something like Docker, you can probably use like, you know, VM or other tools to build your, your, your infrastructure, like, you know, like, like Ansible or Puppet, I mean, anything that you like to. There is a, I mean, a nice project called Drupal VM that you can take advantage of. And ideally, you should require Drupal VM as a dependency in your project, something like Composer Require, Girling Guy, you know, Drupal VM, and that get, that project in your system and your vendor directory, and from there you can make some little changes on the on the config files, you know which image you are requiring to, and what, how much memory you want to assign, and then doing something like this, you can share the same environment to, with everyone in your team. I mean, everyone is running the project using the same thing. You know, it's like there's no more; it works on my machine. And if you are using Docker, then you are might be handling all this configuration using Docker files. And again. What I was mentioning, this is Drupal VM. It's a really nice project. The bad thing about this is like, <clears throat> I mean, sometimes some people don't like a lot, like VM, I mean, because you I mean, using Drupal VM, well, I mean, using Mac and Docker, you are also probably need to get, you know, VirtualBox and, you know, Vagrant and all that. Fortunately, that's changing. But yeah, you can use this one. If you are using Docker, you can do something like this. Create, use Docker and Docker Compose, and this is how, a configuration looks like in order to get like fully working environment using Docker. We have a file here, 
with, we're telling you know which version we are using it, and we're just defining some services. Services is like you know you know are you ever hear about like microservices? You know, we are basically creating like like little boxes here. Think about like we're creating a MariaDB like little box from our installation, and then another PHP box. I mean, containing only PHP. So we are doing something like this with. In order to use, I mean, this Docker Compose file is only defining which image we want to use. It means which version we are trying to work with. And in this case, we're using MariaDB. You can use MySQL, Postgre, anything you want to. You just need to find or create the right image that you want to use and change this line. As you can see here, we're using an environment, an environment file. We'll see how this looks like. So we are, you know, telling MariaDB, you know, read from this file some specific values that you will, see, you will see how it looks looks like. Then we have the same thing for PHP. We have PHP here, but in this case, we're sharing a volume. We are, you know, we're sharing to, we want to, when this is a directory within this box where, where we can access or we can install our Drupal site. And then again, same thing we're telling to this little box that we are using you know, an environment file. Next thing, let's, let's say I want to use Nginx, so I call this I name it as Nginx, give it a name. In this case, I'm using an image. It's just the same Drupal Nginx image. I mean, again, you can create your own images if you want to. We are, I mean, we're taking advantage of those. That works really well for us. And from here, you can, I mean, provide an extra configuration like restarting, I mean, you know, la, la, la. And it also tells you it depends on PHP. It means the PHP should be done first. And from here, we just gave some like, like, like environment variables as well and sharing some volume so we can share it with the other box, with the PHP box, right? And as you can see, finally, we just give them a little like using this reverse proxy, config, I mean, project called traffic. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce these things. Traffic? It's hard. It's uh, okay, that's fine. Well, you just give it, you know, you create, so creating something like this, I mean, this will create automatically a host for you. So you will, once you run it, you will be able to type, you know, something like, you know, like, Deb that my deb that Drupal that something or test that Drupal that something or pull request. I mean, you might be building an environment, a full environment for a specific pull request. I mean, what we are doing in this process is we have an application in while deploy, where I mean, as part of or like CI CD process or workflow, and we are like having it this we, as a place when you have this file and we just create this file on the fly. Well, take this as a template and just replace based on what we want to create here, either test, dev, or something like that, in order to build the, the, the machine, right? But again, as you can see, the whole infrastructure is committed on the repo, so everyone within the team can go git clone that one, Docker Compose app, and just, again, go grab a coffee, go grab a beer, and the computer will be like done. Same thing with using Drupal VM, you know, background up. Let's talk about configuration. Remember what I mentioned about this EMB file that we were sharing with the machine? We have, okay, uh, first thing, what, what do we call configuration? Just to do not get confused with configuration management. Configuration is anything that changes between environments, right? Code is it's what is what is, doesn't change, right? Code is every single environment. Again, remember what I told you, one code base and multiple deploy, I mean deploys. We have staging, like dev, test, prod. I mean, my view, you are used to seeing always dev test and prod, right? I mean, in going back and forward. I mean, at this point, I mean, that's a good thing to do, but it doesn't matter anymore. You can just create as many stages as you want to. If you want, you probably want to create one for a specific pull request or a specific commit, right? It's not like you need to have all those three stages in order to have a full, like, I mean, process in place. You might be have like local and test and QA. Maybe you are in a new feature and then you create a new pull request Someone, and then you can automatically deploy this using something like this. Have, I mean, since remember what I mentioned about this traffic thing, you can make this available for your client so, you, so your client can see you know, that feature running. And uh, in order to, to manage configuration, we are not going to commit those values to the repo, right? We don't want to put like our database credentials there. So what we are, it's highly recommended to, or it's recommended to use the environment and using like non-control, non-version control EMB files. And it also is good to practice to have different configuration files per environment. Let's say I want to have this a specific configuration for production and for testing. Let's say I want to like enable tweak debug or disable tweak and disable tweak catch on my local environment. So I will have one file 
calling something like services.local.yml and with different configuration than my file that I was running on production. And this is good practice because you, will, you can load those files based on the environment you are working with. In order to do this in Drupal, uh, there is a project called php.amb. You only need to do composer require this, this project name and you will get it in your system. And I will show you how you use it, how you will use it. First, you need to create this, this file for you. This file, again, remember, never commit this file into your repo. It should be created on your server. Again, you, this could be pro this process. It's, it's done in our case, but we have all this automated through our application. So we create this. We create, basically, what do we just do? It just, we just create a like, node on DigitalOcean or Linux or AWS. Then we just generate this file based on the project and has all this data. So this file should contain, can contain as many values as you want to. We have this em environment. So in this file, we define which environment this belongs to. In this case, log could be like local, test, prod, anything you want to. And from there, you can add as many, I mean, key values that you require, like database name, user, password, like host, port, anything that it's changing per station or per, per environment. Again, values here or, or this configuration is what it changes between different stages. And finally, sometimes you require to have like twi Twitter API key or any other services, I mean, keys on, I mean, API keys for those. We define, we also define it here using the settings underscore prefix. And you will see how, how we use it, how we, what the process, what, what we just do in order to load all those values. And we make changes in our settings PHP file. And this is how our, 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 our settings file looks like. It's, it has a validation for, you know, is the, if this file exists, then get in a new instance of this class. So this .emb, I mean, class that you can see here, it's part of the php.emb project that we just required before. And just give it the directory where the project is at and just call the load method. This one takes care of reading those values and make them available for use. And how, and how I'll use it. So what we, we also have in the settings file, we have this EMB equals to environment. So EMB will contain which environment that I'm working, where, where, which environment is, is actually working. In this case, it could be like local, again, test, production. We can give it a, like PR ID or something. Or, and then finally, remember those, those key values with the prefix of settings underscore? So we have something like this. We have this little iteration and we are just I mean, find anyone containing this value, and we just set on the settings array. I mean, if you set something here, then you can use it within Drupal. So we are setting the key value, which is basically Bart Bass and Lauren Ibsen. So we get rid of the settings part, where we just manage like this in order to make this like easily to iterate and read and actually set before on this part of the process. And remember what I told you, you can have, it's a good practice to maintain different configuration files based on the environment. So what we have here, we obtain the path where the Drupal is running, and then we create this services file and settings file based on the current environment. Let's say if we are in local, this will take something like services, that local, that YML. If we are on, on a specific stage like testing or QA or whatever you wanna call this, it should be a file the name here was something like services.qa.yml. And this, is, each one of those files could contain different configurations based on the environment or per environment. And as I mentioned before, most, most of the time on, the, on your local environment, you want to, dis, you want to disable like, like tweak cache, right? Or enable tweak debug. And instead of running, I mean, like what was the Drupal console command? Site mode EMB or site mode production that keeps changing the same file all over again. And then it's kind of hard because you need to keep maintaining this file on your main committed in your repo. So in this case, we maintain different files per environment. So we don't, there's no risk for us to, I mean, make some change and forgot to doing something like that. Cause I mean, some, I mean, I remember running the site environment, I mean, site mode and then putting like a development and then pushing that code to production. And my, I mean, in my, I mean, JavaScript and CSS files were not minified, so I was like loading like hundreds, I mean, like hundreds of files and was like, why my site is, is this kind of slow for loading because I don't have all those files like minify and just and aggregate it. And finally, 
we have a validation. If the file exists, then just load it. And then Drupal will get all those values and, and use those per environment, right? And then finally, our settings PHP file, I mean, for the database connection, looks like this. And it's, as you can see, we are reading the same values that we just set on the EMB file, right? And this EMB file is shared between my, my containers, which is the one on the database and the one that is running the site. So everything is pretty straightforward. I don't have to manage those on the, on the configuration. And we don't even have to go to the server and, and create those because we have a process that copy this or create this EMB file on the project prior to running I mean, the, the orchestration. Well, finally, the last piece of the workflow is you know, building the artifact, you know, building the process and pushing to a specific server. What do you have here? I mean, build, let's say build, release, and run. We can define build as, as the process or the stage that converts your code repo into an executable bundle. It means the one who go and get the dependencies by using you know, Composer in this case. And also like by running JARN or you know, NPM or anything else. Then release is the, is, this, is the stage that takes this configuration and, and you mix, and mix it and mix it with the code, well, I mean, sorry, with the, with the configuration per a specific environment. And finally, run is the process to having your, your site like running, right? Or, I mean, the app, I mean, application executable. And I mean, it's a good practice to run builds. I mean, or in each, in, I mean, execute a build I mean, whenever new code is, is pushed, I mean, any pull request should do something. Let me start the build for you. And ideally, ideally, right? I mean, it's not like you are going to do that. But the benefit of doing this, like this implementing this continuous, like their delivery method or workflow, is like you are just like reviewing minimum changes of your project or per feature projects instead of like, you know, let's wait until Friday 5 p.m. for do the deployment, right? So this is better. And in order to create a release, every release should have use his, I mean, a unique ID. This should be like, could be like a timestamp or an incremental ID. And um, something, I mean, something that you need to re remember is really, once you do a tag or do a release, I mean, this, this, I mean, this should not be changed or mutated. So it means once it's created, you cannot change the configuration or something. So if you want to make changes, you send another pull request and then a new instance of your server, I mean, of your server are, is created. And okay, how you run the build, it's again, since we are using Composer, you'll be running Composer, inst I mean, Composer install. Just make sure you run with the, using this flag, like no dev, to avoid getting like the development dependencies. Because I, re I recall a few months ago, there was an issue with, with Coder. With, with Coder is a tool we use for like, like reviewing I mean, or coding like the like code is different for Drupal with the Drupal rules. I mean, you should never have those development tools on your production server, right? So ideally, you should run this with using no dev. Then in order to like, we have this kind of scripts for, for building like, like our sites. So this is how your or build local command looks like. This is a something with Drupal console. We have something called chain commands. Those commands read a YAML file and can execute different commands I mean, like in a queue. So we have this new command called build local. If you add something like this to your ch chain definition, it automatically register as a command. So it means this is a new command that appear on my listing. So I can run Drupal build local. And we use Q, I mean, several commands here, like installing I mean, site install for installing Drupal from scratch, right? Remember what I told you, it's, it's a good practice to rebuild your site every single time. And then use, mod I mean, if I want to install something like features, like this uh, module that I will be only using in, in my local environment, we kind of do things like this. And we just, I mean, in this case, we're managing, let's say we're managing configurations using like features. So we have features import command to import any feature we have, this, I mean, override any features. And finally, you can also create like nodes. Let's populate your site with dummy data, calling this create terms and create nodes commands. And at the very end, just clear cache, make sure everything is working. But as you can see here, I'm just running Composer install and passing the flag force. So it means I am not telling to the command where, I mean, where those settings are, because it means reading the settings file, which is reading the EMB variable. So I mean, I don't have to worry about giving credentials or nothing like that. You just run one command, everything is there for you. How about our station server? It's a little different. So instead, we give it a name again, but instead of running, you know, 
site install every single time on a station. What we just do is run the database restore command. We also have another like environment variable which tell where the where the backup is. So in this case, we run this one, reads one file, and just import that database so we, or station server. It has uh, it's reading and importing uh, previously database dump that we have. Again, we compose it. Then in this case, we run update execute, run any pending, you know. Maybe, maybe what, what, uh, what this pull request is containing is a module update. So we want to run, make sure we run any pending hook database update, right? Update, execute all. And finally, we also run, you know, features import again to override features. And at the very, very end, we run config export. Because ideally, when using features, you use features for development, but once you get to the point that you are in a station server ready to push all that code to your production server, on your production server, you are supposedly not to use features. Ideally, you should manage features until the stage server point, and then from here, run configuration export, and in your server, while building your production server, you should run compose, I mean, config import instead of features import. That's like the idea. That's something that the, the feature maintainer is, is now managing. You know, use features for development, but at the very end, prior to the, the deploying, just make sure you export the whole thing. And then instead of running, you know, features command on production server rules, just run config import to import the whole configuration that was exported on the build process. And finally, for the build, we have something like this. And, and you know, in, in, in the case of build, we are not going to I mean, um, restore from a specific, I mean, database. We are doing the inverse thing. We are doing database dump to create a database dump. If something goes wrong, we can just easily, easily roll back just by restoring that database, okay? So we expo export the database. We give it, a, again, we give it, we take the database name. Again, update execute for any pending hook updates. Config import, remember I told you about features. Features, when, while building the artifact, export that configuration. It means your production server, instead of running features, just run conf configuration import to read those files and just get it in your, in your active configuration and cache rebuild at the very end. Okay, just the final, final slide. While you are, one way to avoid like, like downtime of your server while deploying, let's say again, let's go back here. Remember, this one builds your artifact. This builds your site, then between this one and, the, and this build process, while deploying to your server, in this case, we are seeing the case like deploying to a, to a BPS server, let's say. While deploying, it's a good practice to have all those releases in a different directory. As you remember what I told you, those should have like a unique ID. In this case, we're using timestamp. So we're creating a specific directory for every single release here. Then it also good practice to have this shared directory. This shared contains files in any, in any any file that should be shared across, I mean, across different like deployments. So we and we also have this current directory. So this is a sim link to the very last release. It means when you are building, when you are doing your deployment, let's say you use this to this specific directory, you create this directory, just start running the build here, your, your, your final build here. And once the whole process gets completed and there's no errors, then just you change the sim link to current to the very last release. And then it means you don't have any downtime, I mean, while you are deploying. So, I mean, in this case, we are deploying, right, on, the, on this directory. Every process run here, you know, every part of this build script run in that, in that directory. Once it's done and it's completed, there's no errors, then this, this I mean, this sim link change, it, it, just, it just happens and then your web server points to here, and then there is no there is no downtime for your project. In order to take it to do something like this, you can use any of those tools. Like you know, there's plenty of tools. Those are the tools we've been playing and more happy with. Like Capistrano, it's a Ruby, it's a Ruby project that allows you to do something like this, like automatically, so you don't have to worry about creating the sim link and you know, making sure every, if something fails, you have to roll back. It, those tools also provide you with a rollback command. It means you can easily roll back just by typing, you know, rollback, and then everything goes back. Actually, I mean, you have to do little things, you know, like adding your scripts for, for the, like this one, for restoring your database. But other than that, those projects takes care of managing this current releases and shared directory structure for you.
There's, again, it's Capistrano, which is Ruby. From PHP, you can find Deployer and Rocketeer. And there is another project called Ancestrano, which is a uh, set of, ans I mean, Ansible playbook recipes following the, the same idea of Capistrano. It's a pretty cool project. Those are pretty cool. I mean, it works pretty fine and allow you to you know, have this this directory structure in your production server and you know, save you a lot of headaches and a lot of time. I mean, you don't want to write all this yourself. Some people have already done that for you and it works fine. I think that's all that I have, so I want to say thank you. Again, you can find me, J. Emily Davis. <laughs> You can find me in JMOLIBAS. We know Drupal Console. If you have any questions, just feel free to ask or just get to the front.